welcome to the Data Democracy. Presented by renowned O'Reilly author Ole Olsen Banyu. And powered by Xenia. Make your data accessible and discoverable by anyone, anywhere, at any time. Hi, everybody. You're listening to The Data Democracy, and I am your host, Ole Olesen Benue, Chief Evangelist in Senea, and the author of the Enterprise Data Catalog published by Aureli. In this podcast, we explore what data democracy is with knowledgeable guests. Today's guest is Scott Hillman. Scott is an authority in the data mesh community. I dare even say Scott was the person that enabled the global data mesh community to organize and to get so big. I personally owe so much to Scott as he invited me onto his podcast, Data Mesh Radio, and by that catapulted me into the global data community. His podcast is one of the best at all. I really encourage you to follow it. Okay, so my takeaways from my conversation with Scott. First, the data leader takeaway. The key aspect of taking leadership in data is to be able to create a community around you. Think of yourself as a community manager and listen to learn what that is. A data democracy takeaway. Get the quiet ones to speak. Often, they are the ones with the most to say and that ultimately makes data more accessible. And third, a personal takeaway. Scott is a big inspiration you rarely find that much energy in one single person. Okay, enough of me talking. Let's hear what Scott has to say. Hi, Scott. <laughs> Hi, Ole. <laughs> um, happy to have you on. Thanks for coming. Yeah, very, very happy to be here. I, I, I always enjoy chatting with you. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. Yeah, I was a guest on uh, uh, Data Mesh Radio. It seems like ages ago. It's definitely not. But Scott, in this particular episode, I think we should skip what have you done in your work life uh, because I I wanted to invite you on for a very special reason, and that is that I see you as a kind of very, very special and important figure in the data mesh community internationally. So, so I want to ask you only about data mesh stuff and what you've done in that regard. And and I first off, how did you become interested? How did you discover data mesh? It's a very, very random story. So I uh, was on Twitter and I kept seeing somebody, Gwen Shapira, who was at Confluent at the time and now um, is a co-founder of, of the company Nile. But uh, she was talking a lot about data mesh. And so I was kind of asking around about it. Somebody else was asking about, hey, does anybody have anything around data mesh? I, I started to see it pop up more and more as I was doing community management stuff around data in general. And I asked somebody internally and said, hey, do we have any content around this data mesh? And they misinterpreted my message and said, yeah, yeah, learn as much as you can. And so <laughs> there was only about 40 or 50 articles or anything out at that point. So I was able to, to do that relatively quickly and then got in, in touch with because I wanted to understand more and saw there were all these people that were trying to ask her questions, but there wasn't really a centralized place. And the role, I was supposed to be jumping into multiple different communities, but so I was supposed to help out and start the data mesh community and move on after two weeks. But we went from zero to a thousand people in under two weeks. So oh. yeah, the, the data stacks was like, hey, just see where this goes and see what we can learn from community management and from kind of a space that we're kind of tangential. So it's a very weird story as to I saw something a couple of people said, and then randomly it became my life for the next, you know, X number of years. But, but Scott, I mean, I guess most listeners know here that, that you're referring to Jamak Degani, the author of the Data Mesh oh, yeah, book. Uh, but, but, but how come, I mean, one thing is to like uh, get, get a lot of traction. Um, uh, seeing a possible uh, uh, sweet spot for yourself. But what really made you interested in like the topic of data mesh? So I think it was, and, and even when I, I wasn't, I don't have a data and analytics background. I, I more database because that's where I was, I was focused was kind of, you know, the NoSQL market. But um, 
the empathy that I saw in Jamak's presentations. You know, when I first tried to read the blog post uh, that she put on Martin Fowler's site, I didn't get it. It just was like, this seems like there's something here. It seems like this is a really smart person who's written this, but I don't get it. And then I watched some of her presentations and it was so much empathy around everybody involved from the data producers, the data consumers, the data team in the, in the middle. They're all having a bad time. So let's get them to having a good time and get them to, to producing a lot of value. That's what actually just caught me. It wasn't, it wasn't, and, and it seemed like it was logical the more I dug into it, the more it was like, well, yeah, we have learned how to do this. I was embedded in an SRE team when I was managing AWS costs for a, a public company. And so much of the stuff was just like, yeah, this is what software engineers do, isn't it? Why are the data people so, so different? And so it just seemed like it was a logical approach. And the more that I learned it about it, the more it was like, oh, this is so much harder than it needs to be. So my, my original idea was with starting the community was, okay, we'll get enough information. We'll, we'll really figure out how to do this in about 24 months. And that was, you know, in February of, of 2021. And then 2022 comes around. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's been a year, but I think it'll take about 36 months. And then 2023 comes around. It's like, okay, I think we're headed in a good direction, but it'll take 48 months. <laughs> so <laughs> I just keep, keep, keep. But yeah, it's, it's so much uh, a place where we can drive value from data and make, make uh, our companies more effective, but make people's lives within data and analytics better. And, mm. and I know that sounds cheesy, but it's just like, I don't want people to have to struggle when they don't need to. No, no, of course. I mean, to me, this is very linked to, uh, to, to, to the topic of this podcast, to democratizing data uh, and enable a lot of people to do a lot of stuff with data, right? So, so I'm happy to hear that the motivation behind this from your side was this, also this feeling of, of empathy. I remember, so not branding too much, but I remember discovering those blog posts on Martin Fowler's blog as well. And I, th I had kind of the same feeling like, that you had that, okay, this is very interesting, intriguing, even also a little confusing, but definitely something I want to pursue. I don't want to ask all the questions at once here, but I am very curious to, to, to hear you out. So, but just this one then, um, in terms of democratizing data, as I see a data mesh, that is one of the like a core ambitions to make data more useful, findable, accessible to anyone in a company, right? Look back a little now, Scott. It's 2023. We're almost into 2024. Have we succeeded? Have we not succeeded? Why? Why not? To what degree? Is, is the data mesh up and running? Are more people getting more easily access to data? To, um, to data why or why not and and i struggle with the same thing with my podcast when i i ask people like 17 questions in one because but yeah. it, 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 you, <laughs> sorry sorry no you're, you're going for the heart of it and i would say to the vast majority no we still still aren't doing data mesh right um we aren't recognizing jamax full vision but we're incrementally going in that it, we're incrementally making progress and we're realizing value along the, the way, which has not historically been the way of a lot of data approaches. It's been, we'll get to value. It's the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and you just keep following the rainbow. And then the next vendor puts up another rainbow and you go and you follow up that, that rainbow, that, that mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is we are struggling in a lot of ways in general in data. One is, is data modeling. And I wish I understood data modeling more because a lot of people ask me data modeling questions and I just go, ah, people <laughs> say data vault or third normal form or things. Like, eh. yeah. But we, so there, there's, there's a part of Jamax vision as to encapsulating data for use cases that you don't know <clears throat> exist and that you think may exist in the future we're struggling really badly with that, right? We're struggling to say, how do I store data in such a way that where I don't know what the use case is, but somebody can come in and leverage it rather than, you know, okay, I'm just going to store raw data and, and the 
uh, consumer has to to uh, you know clean it up and and structure it on consumption. We're struggling with what data do we even need and what like how are we gonna how are we gonna structure that? You're you're, you're going to be involved in a panel on 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 my podcast uh, mm-hmm. in, in the near future about like how do producers understand what they need to create and then how do they create it in such a way that consumers can even find it we're, we're mm-hmm. you know you're you're working and and I'm 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 really excited to see kind of where you take this but we're still struggling to for consumers to understand what is the art of the possible there's this okay if i know exactly what i'm looking for i can go and find it in the catalog but how do we communicate that connecting the dots of wouldn't it be great if you had this capability or wouldn't it be great if you had that? So I'm starting to see some people that are enablement leads as to taking the producers and bringing them to the, cons- or taking the consumers and bringing them to the potential producers and going, here is something that could exist. Is this a value? Why is this a value? Let's, let's move forward with that. Um, so I would say we're at Probably, you know, if, if I'm using the American grading scale of, you know, A to, to F, we're at, at best to C minus mm. right now. And <laughs> we were at a, at, a, at a D, you know, mm. two, three years ago. So we're getting better. But there's just this huge gap. Mm. And, and as well, you know, you talked about getting people access, that democratization. You know, we can't give people access to all data. No, and no, we no. can't, we can't also think about what are all the scenarios that someone might use this in. And so people are trying to programmatically think ahead and only give access to the things that should be given access to versus human curiosity and, and use cases. You can't necessarily think of all of them ahead of time. That's one of the cognitive overloads on the data team. So I, I answer. I, I went in fifty different directions, but I, I think the answer overall is we're making progress, but we're nowhere near where the vision of what it could be is. Mm. But is that vision way too pie in the sky? Is it way too much? Like this is what we could do with data, and it could change the world. And then we actually get into how you do it, and it <laughs> <laughs> the cost benefit isn't there or anything like that. So. It, it resonates very much with my own experience. Um, I have to say, uh, when you ask a, a question that goes in 50 different directions, you might get an answer that goes in 50 different directions also. So, so, so no, uh, no harm done there, Scott. I think you touch upon a lot of interesting stuff there because first of all, this problem of making products, data products available for use cases that do not exist yet. This is a paradox, right? And I've been confronted with this earlier in my career with people saying, um, you shouldn't be doing these products because you don't have a use case. But it's like when you open a restaurant, if you open a grocery store, so something where you sell either food you cannot directly eat or like products you want to consume, you cannot predict how many people are actually coming inside the shop, right? You have that problem of saying, okay, I'm opening a shop. I'm going to make this shop a really, really nice shop. So I think people will come, but I don't know. I mean, nobody knows. So it's this mindset of actually being capable of accepting, okay, I cannot define the use case yet. And okay, I guess in data that that also defines how you structure a data product and so forth, right? But it's it's still this fact that you just have to go in the, into that discussion um, and then ranting on a bit more, I also think you're very right in this role that can bridge these people. I mean, uh, the consumers and uh, and the producers. I have also experienced earlier in my work life um, how you can how can you, you can actually make people. It, it takes a lot of investigation, and of course, your organization has to accept that, right? But I've guess I guess you have seen that those examples a lot, where if if data architects, enterprise architects, or like leaders of various data departments are given the chance to actually go do some uh, archaeology or speleology or whatever you want to call it, where you go into the organization and you really discover, okay, so. 
this department is buying data from this external company that we delivered to them three years ago, free of charge. And now we have to pay money for that, but we could just pull it from that department if we built this pipeline using uh, establishing these products. I mean, these kinds of problems, once you get into the, to the true details of, of, an, of a data architecture, I think you can unlock a lot of use cases like that, but it just takes time, right? Anyway, that was me ranting and that it should have been you ranting, Scott. But uh, oh, I think you made some really good points in there that I think intersect with what we were, you know, what I was saying, but I think it's a good reflection of what I don't understand the gap. There is a gap that there's a clear gap that I'm seeing that exists. I don't mm -hmm. understand the cause between I have created a data product and I am a consumer and I'm going to find and, and create a use case off of an existing data product. Is it because we're not modeling well enough that people can use it for uh, any use case? Is it that consumers don't understand how to take generically modeled data and leverage it? Is it, do we need a new way of data modeling? Do we need to significantly increase the consumer's capabilities? Do we need these data Sherpas or, you know, uh, kind of enablement people or, or uh, data librarians of taking people that have curiosity and helping them find what they need? Should that only be in, via the, the catalog? I would love that the tools could do all of that, but tools can't anticipate the changes in the real world in that way. So, you know, you and I talked about this on, on our episode way back when it was like a year and a half ago. And I think it's almost mm. 200 episodes ago for me. Yeah, <laughs> that's I, and I have some questions for you on, on your radio, uh, on data mesh radio, but that goes, yeah, anyway. But, but you, we were talking about what should be on the humans and what should be on the machines and should the librarians, because we talked about how important information sciences is to understanding data discovery, data democratization, all of that. Should they be focused on tooling and enablement and being in the background to automate, or should they be focused on the one-to-one? -one? And you fell more on the tooling side and I fall more on the human side, but there's a mix. And I would say, mm. you know, instead of if it's here and here, you're here and I'm here. Versus, you know, you're here and here, but like, I think it's, it's a question. I think it ends up that the people that try to go purely for tooling go in the complete wrong direction, but the same oh, thing, yeah. people, it's not scalable. And so like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a tough dilemma. And I've seen that many places uh, after i wrote my book uh, of course i've been doing some consultancy for for various companies big industries primarily and i've seen a lot of uh, well primarily i've seen a lot of uh, can technology take care of this kind of uh, uh, failures to be honest and and of course it can't i mean you need that human element but I want to promote a little bit uh, your podcast, Scott. Uh, Data Mesh Radio is a source of gold for understanding um, Data Mesh. It's it's an, an enormous library of conversations with practitioners and also like thinkers and academics. But but what I really like about it is that you are capable of attracting so many skilled data practitioners at at various levels, right? Architects. Uh, doers, but also strategists and leaders. And um, I want to ask you, since, uh, since you've made this enormous effort with Data Mesh Radio, what made you establish the Data Mesh Radio? Why, why did you want to do that? Uh, um, I'll answer it with one sentence and then go further. But what is Data Mesh, right? That conversation and the amount of content, so, you know, we established the community in early February of 2021. And, you know, and I, I partnered with uh, Jamak and, and Robert Sahalin, um, who, who quickly was like, eh, this is too much. Scott's too much to deal with, I think. I think he wanted to focus on things outside of Data Mesh. But um, in December of 2021, and, and, and even in October or so, there was probably 25 articles a week about Data Mesh that were coming out. I was managing. Um, I, I think I was just starting to hand over the data mesh learning 
um, which is the community. I don't know. I can't remember if we've actually clearly said the community is called Data Mesh Learning. And then, um, but I had handed over the, or I was in the process of handing over the newsletter um, to Andrew Padilla because every of those 25 articles that were coming out on a weekly basis, 20 to 23, 24, sometimes all 25 were what is Data Mesh? And most of them were not that great. Mm. Uh, they were, they missed a lot of the points. They made uh, a, a lot of kind of uh, errors about it. And so there wasn't a source of content for practitioners. And so my idea was, I, I kind of made the joke of, well, I'm going to create like 300 episodes, you know, just kind of laughing about that. And now, you know, that's going to be, I think two and a half months from now, I'm going to hit episode 300 or something. But, wow. Um, it's, yeah. It's, in, it's insane, Scott. Anyway, that, I, I was cutting you <laughs> off. Sorry. <laughs> No, well, but it's it's been going almost two years, and so I do um, two a week for a while. I was doing whenever I recorded them, and so you know there were some weeks when I'd put out three or four episodes, and then for a while I was on three episodes a week, and that was just that was too much. But um, the idea is to create content around if you have a couple of sets of questions or one set of question, one topic that you want to dig into, you can go and listen to ten episodes. Right. Oh, I want to understand, you know, uh, Data Mesh talks about federated computational governance. OK, what does that mean? I want to talk. I want to listen to some stuff around governance. Like, what should I go listen to? Oh, there's there's 10, 12 episodes on governance. OK, I want to understand how to do domain driven design in data. There's that. So the idea was there was no set of of content really that was coming out for practitioners that's changed but that's you know we're about two years on mm. but i still like even early in the in the the episode or the life cycle of the, the podcast i started to look into data contracts because it came up in two or three con um conversations and this was late 20 uh late 2021 early 2022 before the huge uh explosion of of content at one point, I could find eight pieces of content, and four of them were from Data Mesh Radio. So mm. it gave me an ability to dig into this stuff in such a way and then elevate people. Like Andrew Jones, I had to kind of harass and harangue him to come on. He was like, I don't know, should I be this? And I'm like, you're the only one that's talking about this, and mm. all these people want this information. So, you know, it's, it, it gives me as well something you know i talked with shemak about this and sorry I'm, I'm going on and on but i talked with shemak about this Just early go. in the community in, in the life of the community that we can be different and that we can create a community we can create a space in the community that isn't just you know all white men even though <laughs> <laughs> here we are, are the, white yeah. bold men <laughs> yeah. um but I, it's but i mean it, it's no longer like you know if you look at my my list of guests if you look at your list of guests you're you're interviewing a number of of um people from underrepresented groups and and i try to make sure that i'm creating a space where we can find and elevate those voices where the simplest thing is to go out and find these you know these guys that want to come in and come on yeah i, I Instead of going and, and saying, like, let's get the perspectives of people that haven't traditionally been asked. Mm -hmm. And so it gave me that that capability as well to elevate a lot of people that maybe not wouldn't have had that same uh, possibility of, of getting their their name and their voice out there. So I go and I and I, you know, sometimes I poke at them until they say yes. And sometimes they, they run away. But it's being persistent about creating a space where we can be different. This mm. concept was created by a woman, you know, a, a, a Iranian woman who, you know, had to fled uh, the, the persecution of the uh, Iranian government and kind of the, you know, uh, tyrannical oversight. And so why can't we create a space that's different and that it's so, her whole perspective is so created in empathy. Why can't we create a space of empathy? Again, I'm going on way too much, but yes, that's no. But I, I like it. I even love it. Um, I think that way too much, uh, and and here we are, right, uh, sitting as some <laughs> completely like uh, like the cliche of 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 tech dudes, right? But but I really sense that in the data mesh movement that it's 
it's trying to formulate something where like macho tech it's not simply yeah so it's more empathetic it's more inclusive and i i love that and i i see i see your podcast as and and the community that you have created basically around you in that light and i i really admire that uh, it's it's something to i guess that must be what you're most proud of it was a question is that what you're most most proud of with data mesh radio radio ah uh, i think that's a really difficult question for me because i'm not somebody that's uh, I, i'm that uh I know, AUDHD. I, yeah. I i don't ever i'm never proud of anything i'm always wanting to move forward with more but i i do think like finding people and you know like amy regatta was somebody that i I first brought on and started connecting to a bunch of people. Now she's doing a ton of content. Amara Gafur at, at ThoughtWorks, um, you know, I was her first podcast. I was one of her, the first times she had ever gone out and spoken. And, you know, I, I kind of uh, got her to, to host a panel for me. And she, it was the first time she was ever even on a panel. And she was like, can I really do this? And now, you know, she went and presented at Big Data London. And I had like 10 people come up to me and just said, that was like the most fantastic presentation I've seen in years. Mm -hmm. And most of them were women going, that was so inspiring. I want to mm -hmm. be like her. I want to do that. So going out and finding those people and, and, and doing that, it is that it's creating a space that where we can be different and where we can, we can be ourselves. Like right now, um, you know, my t-shirt, you can't really see it, but it says, I have no idea what I'm doing. And it's got like a confused <laughs> looking cat. Like, we can be goofy and we can be humans in this space and still provide value and, and information to each other. And so, uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot of things where I've, I've had good accomplishments. You know, at one point we were, according to Meetup, the fastest growing meetup in the world relative to the concept of data. And, you know, we went, we were just a rocket ship. But I think creating a space for us to exchange information and be more empathetic even if it's still difficult for a lot of people for many reasons, but like creating that space where we can say, I don't know, or what the heck, or like, and, and it's not that there are solid answers. It's that we exchange information with each other and rely on each other. It, it's something where I'm still not proud of where it's gone because it, it hasn't solved it like I want it to, <laughs> but I think we we're we're working towards that. So again, it's difficult for me to to be proud of things because it's just the way my brain works. Yeah, yeah, you're so discreet that at a certain point I was afraid of tagging you on LinkedIn, Scott, because I knew that it would annoy you to be tagged. Uh, so so, and I, I but that I admire. I mean, being discreet is a total discipline, right? Um, and and also finding the voices that do not necessarily want to talk but have a lot to say. And actually opening those voices to the data communities, that's a huge um, effort uh, that you took for, for all of us. So, so I'm very thankful for that. And you helped me as well. I am perhaps, I fall into the category of, of, of the typical, I don't know, tech dude, but I am, if, if you were not, I think you were the first podcast I appeared on when I was writing my book. And, and I was thinking like, hmm, could I really be on a podcast? Now thinking back of it, like, Doing an O'Reilly book, of course, I have something to say, of course. But 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 like you had to change my mind with that, and and you did. So I'm very thankful also personally for that. But it shouldn't be about me. It's um, anyway. So what's the future? Just to close uh, the data mesh radio uh, questions here. What's the future of uh, of data mesh radio? Well, and I did want to go back to one thing and and maybe correct you a little bit, which is that I don't think we are the typical tech dude. Oh, we no. are from 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 a uh, uh, you know a demographic background, but I think we're talking empathy, and I think being mm. open and honest about that stuff. You know, I look at the team topologies folks and things like that. I think we're we're bringing in a, a world of understanding that isn't certainty, and it isn't it, it is about like actual communication. But yeah, when it comes yeah. to data mesh radio, I, I would love to not have to be the one doing data mesh radio. I would like when I originally did the community, I never wanted to be a public facing person. Um, I like to be in the background. I like to do kind of top of funnel things of bring people into a community or connecting the people. You know, I connect a lot of people to speaking opportunities and things as soon as I meet them. You know, anytime I meet any um, 
anybody from an underrepresented group that's involved with ML ops, for instance, I push them over to Demetrius Brinkman with that that community. But like where I I I want to go with data mesh radio is I do want to shut it down as much as 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 that sounds weird. My goal is to get to a place where we have relatively addressed most of the necessary questions. Hmm. I think that's going to be episode 500, episode 550, so it'll be around for another couple of years, but I would really really love to to be in a place, you know, Jamak has said this, I have said this. We don't want to be talking data mesh. We want to be talking about how to do data work well, how to deliver value via data work. And we think that data mesh is a great mechanism for doing that, but data mesh isn't the point. And we don't want to be talking about data mesh. And as wild as that sounds, I've got a company, data mesh understanding. I created a community, data mesh uh, learning. I have a podcast, data mesh radio. I don't want us talking about data mesh. I want it to fade into the background because we figured out how to do that. But to do that, we actually have to figure out how to do it. And we're mm. not there yet. And, you mm. know, Max company is is working towards that and and all of that but uh, we haven't figured out how to do this well i've only talked to 10 or so companies that are per, far enough along that they're like this was absolutely worth the effort and we're seeing you know the 10x return on it there's a lot that are like we're seeing good return but it's just the return of good data work mm. and so I want to do that. And then I would love to kind of, again, fade in the background. And I'm ADHD, um, you know, AUDHD as well, uh, but that I can go and focus on something completely different. Before I was doing this, I was business process. And before that, I was um, doing managing AWS costs for a public company. So I like to bounce around and do different things. I just, I we need to figure out how to do this well before I can go into another yeah, space. Yeah. yeah, totally, totally. Okay, so two things I want to ask you on that. First off, is, is is those ten companies? Is that a public list? No, because I no no I I I've, I've struggled to run this because I don't want to be like I I've wanted to hang some some like gold medals and you know give out the awards and stuff like that. And I think we probably will with data mesh uh, learning with the community in some form or fashion. But there are some that think that they're really there and aren't, and I don't really I don't want to. Uh, oh, tell yeah. tell the kid that they're not my favorite. Yeah, I, yeah, that's, I have uh, other kids that are my favorite. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's a oh yeah, that's a that's a difficult one right there. Okay, so the other thing, and that's not a question, but the the moment you decide to shut down a data mesh radio, Scott, you need to send out a worldwide appeal to so we can have a data mesh uh, radio shutdown party somewhere in the world, all of us. Yeah, we, with all, all the guests, because we're all at the guests, all 200? the listeners. Yeah, we need to have like a big, big party somewhere in the world. But 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 that's for the future. I wanna I wanna I wanna ask a last question here, uh, Scott, um, about uh, data mesh understanding the new company that you founded. Uh, I think you should have the chance to explain what that is, and I think a lot of listeners are curious to learn what it is also. So can you share some some light on what what are, what is that? So, I mean, it, it's, it's funny because I made it as a joke off of data mesh learning that I, I created the, the name of data mesh understanding. And, um, and then I've talked to multiple people and they're like, what's data mesh learning? And I'm like, I may have made a mistake on that naming. But, <laughs> uh, but the idea is to be able to go in and help people understand how to move forward. Take, you know, I've, I've had five, 600 conversations with practitioners, you know, 200 that are on the podcast, but um, help them understand how to move forward. You know, oh, I've got this question and I've got this persistent question and okay, how do I actually do this? Well, the answer of it depends is frustrating. So you tell me what it depends on and I tell you, I, I work with you to do that. So um, the original idea was, was, uh, a lot around kind of one-to-one, -one, uh, communication and doing kind of private round tables and things. And there's some appetite for that, but what I'm finding is people just want me to go in and, and help them set up their actual long-term roadmap and, and I'll get alignment because it's so, 
data people shouldn't be leading the organizational transformation. Like that's that's <laughs> not part of your why you're hired, yet it is something that you're required to do to do something like data mesh. So how do we get the organization aligned around we're gonna leverage data to be far better at our business, but it's not about the data. It's about being far better at the business and the data just powers that. And, and this whole thing of people think of data as just strategy. And it's like, no, if, if, if you're, the only thing you're using data for is strategy instead of execution, you know, that whole thing of culture eats strategy for back, breakfast. Well, execution absolutely eats everything. <laughs> and you can say execution is part of your culture or whatever, but execution is the thing that matters, right? Ex strategy is important, but execution is what matters. And so we can use data to better power execution. And the second you start to get people bought into that, their mindset shifts so much as to what can data bring to me? Oh, it gives me the ability to not make huge bets. I can make smaller bets quicker and be more nimble and out execute my, my competitors, or they're going to do the same to me. All of a sudden that conversation changes. So going in and helping companies to understand that is, and, and I, I'm more of a business person than I am a data person. So getting, getting to, to talk to the actual business people and the data people in the room are looking at me with a horror when I say data itself doesn't matter. And they're like, what? And it's like, well, it doesn't. It's, it's what does it enable us to do? And we think it can enable us to do a lot. And so getting people aligned around that just gets me excited. In case you couldn't tell, I'm very excited about talking about that. Scott, this is a moment where I say, um, this is the moment where I say, thank you for being on. Uh, this was a pleasure. Uh, and I think this is just where we need to end the conversation. Uh, so really a pleasure having you on. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.